our next speaker will be uh, Dr. David Calabro um, talking about ancient, the ancient Israel temple ritual through the telescope of restoration scripture. Dr. Calabro is a visiting assistant professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University. He holds a PhD in Near Eastern languages and civilizations from the University of Chicago. And prior to his current position at Brigham Young University, he was the curator of Eastern Christian manuscripts at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library in St. John's University. Dr. Calabro. Thank you, and I wanna thank the organizers of this conference for their hard work. Thank you very much. One of the most remarkable things about Joseph Smith's revelations of ancient scripture is how they embody a complex understanding that is consistent with what we know of ancient texts. Just as ancient libraries contain multiple versions of the same text, so do the scriptures of the Restoration. Just as ancient texts reveal multiple layers of transmission, so too did the scriptures of the Restoration. Nowhere is this complexity more clearly evident than in Joseph Smith's revelations corresponding to the first chapters of Genesis. Joseph Smith's interactions with Genesis began with Joseph's translation of the Book of Mormon in 1829, which contained extended references to the Genesis account by the prophets Lehi and Alma in 2 Nephi 2 and Alma 12 through 13. Both of these texts implicitly referencing the plates of brass brought out of Jerusalem around 600 BC contain elements not found in the received text of Genesis. It was only months after the printing of the Book of Mormon in 1830 that Joseph Smith revealed another version of the Genesis account, this time a more complete one, as part of his inspired translation of the Bible. This text eventually became the Book of Moses found in the Pearl of Great Price. Later, following the purchase of some Egyptian mummies and papyri in Kirtland, Joseph Smith revealed the Book of Abraham, which contained yet another version of the Genesis account. In 1842, in the upper room of the red brick store in Nauvoo, Joseph Smith began to reveal what would become the temple endowment. This ordinance contained narrative elements that included, once again, a new version of the Genesis account. Finally, the King Follett discourse and another of Joseph Smith's Nauvoo sermons in 1844 show that Joseph had interacted once again with the Genesis account and received new insights. For those who understand Joseph Smith's revelations primarily as manifestations of the prophet's own reflections, the different versions of the Genesis account are evidence of his developing theology. But I would suggest that the presentation of these texts as ancient scripture is purposeful and important. By providing insights into multiple ancient dispensations, much like the superimposed lenses of a telescope, Joseph Smith's revelations of ancient scripture helped to prepare the saints for the ultimate telescopic experience of the temple endowment. In a recent study on the book of Moses, I explored the question of the ancient historical context to which the book belongs. Previously, it has been assumed that the book of, Mor uh, of Moses represents the original form of the early chapters of Genesis as restored by Joseph Smith. However, I argued in my recent study that the book of Moses actually fits best in an early Christian context. This conclusion was largely based on the language and literary type of the text, which overwhelmingly matched first century Christian literature in contrast to pre-exilic Hebrew literature. However, some parts of the book point unmistakably to a pre-exilic Israelite context and seem to be derived from an earlier text. My study further suggested that the Book of Moses would fit in the performative context of early Christian baptism. If my argument about the Book of Moses is correct, it would mean that the Book of Mormon, the Book of Moses, and Joseph Smith's Nauvoo sermons are all secondary witnesses to, uh, to a pre-exilic version of the Book of Genesis. My intention in the present study is to examine in more detail what these sources reveal about the pre this pre-exilic form of Genesis. I will also explore the possibility of an ancient performative context for the book analogous to that postulated um, for the book of Moses. 
This performative context, I will suggest, was a ritual of consecration for priests, like that described in the tabernacle narratives of the Pentateuch. Although the biblical descriptions of the rites do not mention an accompanying liturgy, it is, it is possible to imagine initiates participating in a temple drama reenacting the early chapters of Genesis. This drama would provide a mythological precedent for the rites of washing, clothing, anointing, setting apart by the laying on of hands, and animal sacrifice, by which, by which rites the priest's consecration was rendered complete. We can begin with revelations pertaining to the first chapter of Genesis. According to Moses 1, uh, verse 1, uh, Moses 2, verse 1, rather, the written part of the revelation, which the book of Moses presupposes, begins with something like Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Joseph Smith commented on Genesis 1, 1 in two sermons in Nauvoo in 1844. In both sermons, he put forth an interpretation quite different from the New Testament-like language of Moses 2.1, but more compatible with an ancient Israelite context. The first is the King Follett sermon, and the second sermon was given in the East Grove in the same year. Um, Kevin Barney has done an in-depth study of the manuscript uh, sources and, and, uh, and the analysis of this text. Um, and, and I'll just make a, a few comments that are different from what Kevin Barney has proposed. Joseph Smith's comments uh, on these verses, on this verse, involve a very small textual emendation to the received text of Genesis 1.1, namely the removal of the preposition be, in, at the beginning of the verse. Joseph also reads rosh, head, a masculine noun that would agree with the verb bara, instead of reshit, beginning which is a feminine noun. Taking this noun as the subject of the sentence forces the following noun, Elohim, God's, as Joseph reads it, to be the direct object of the verb. Thus, Joseph translates this first part of the verse as, the head one of the gods brought forth the gods, apparently a reference <clears throat> to a cosmogony. This in turn forces us to take what follows, et ha-shamayim et ha as something other than the direct object. Joseph does not seem to have explained how he interpreted the grammar here, although he seems to omit the second instance of et, which is uh, usually interpreted as a direct object marker. One approach, which has not been suggested before to my knowledge, would be to interpret the word et not as the direct object marker, nor as a preposition, but rather as a rare noun form there is some limited comparative support for this interpretation. The Egyptian word it, meaning father, and the Amorite word uh, itum, a rare noun of uncertain meaning appearing in the theophoric names Ita Abba and Ita Ili, both from Mari. In light of this evidence, the Hebrew word in question could be a rare or poetic noun meaning father, perhaps inherited from Proto-Afroasiatic or borrowed from Egyptian. God is the father of heaven and of earth, Mosiah 3.8. With this interpretation, the verse in Genesis could be translated thus, the head one brought forth the gods, the father of heaven and earth. The syntax would be similar to Psalm 134.3, where the second colon consists of an extended form of the subject to the first colon, and the second colon also happens to describe God as the creator of heaven and earth. That verse reads, may Yahweh bless you from Zion, the maker of heaven and earth. Like Psalm 134, the beginning of Genesis 1 would then take on a poetic character, appropriate for a choral chant at the introduction of a performance. Indeed, verse 2 is easily scanned as a poetic tricolon. Joseph Smith's interpretation of the first verse of Genesis has ramifications for the interpretation of the rest of Genesis 1. It, um, it implies that the speech throughout this chapter is that of the gods as they meet in council to discuss the creation. Overall, Joseph's interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis, as revealed in his Nauvoo sermons, fits well in an ancient Near Eastern context, such as one would expect for a pre-exilic Israelite text. 
Next, we move to the garden narrative in Genesis 2 through 3. Donald, <clears throat> Donald Perry has drawn attention to the extensive correlation between the Garden of Eden account and the features of the temple in Jerusalem. The coats of skins, coat note or, with which God clothed Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.21, correspond to the coats, kutonot, placed upon Aaron and his sons in the consecration ceremony, Exodus 29, verses 5 and 8. The cherubim positioned east of the garden, this isn't the first time you've seen this particular uh, Im set of images uh, in this conference, and this is, uh, this is one of the greatest hits of Latter-day Saint art, uh, this piece by Michael Lyon appearing in, uh, in um, Donald Perry's article. The cherubim positioned east of the garden to prevent access to the tree of life in Genesis 3.24 correspond to the cherubim on the east doors of the temple and on the entrance to the devere in 1 Kings chapter 6. As Perry shows, the elements, elements characteristic of the priestly writings of the Pentateuch pervade Genesis 2 through 3, allowing us to consider Genesis 1 through 3 as a single compositional unit, despite the break in the continuity of the narrative in Genesis 2, 3 through 4. Genesis 2.6 and 2.10 through 14 mention a stream coming up from the ground and dividing into four rivers that emanated from Eden. But Lehi's dream in 1 Nephi 8 may suggest that the text originally described only two rivers. I have argued elsewhere that the topography of Lehi's dream corresponds to the Garden of Eden as conceptualized in pre-exilic times. The dream included two rivers, one of which was associated with living waters and the other with filthy water. The motif of two opposite rivers, one associated with the celestial waters and the other with the subterranean waters, appears in various ancient uh, creation accounts. Further, a close look at Genesis 2, 10 through 14 shows a significant, uh, shows that, um, shows that it is quite reasonable to suggest that the original text included only the rivers Pishon and Gihon, Verse 14 could have been added at some later date, perhaps during the time of the Babylonian exile, as it would place the two great rivers of Israel's conquerors in a subordinate relationship to the sacred center of Hebrew cosmology. Um, and I argue this point a little more in the, in the um, published uh, version, in the printed version. I'm skipping a little bit here in the interest of time. Moses 4, verses one through seven includes inf uh, information not found in the received text of Genesis on Satan and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. According to the book of Moses, Satan put it into the heart of the serpent to follow him, and it was by the mouth of the serpent that he tempted Eve. Here the serpent and Satan are two separate beings, a scenario similar to what we find in late antique apocryphal literature. In references to the Garden of Eden in 2 Nephi 2, the Book of Mormon prophet Lehi also seems to have access to expansive information on the adversary in the garden, but it is different from the Book of Moses. Here, in contrast to the Moses account, the devil is the serpent. The idea of a consubstantial human serpentine adversary is familiar from ancient Near Eastern mythology. Given Lehi's clear statements of having read these things, it is likely that this reference to the devil was part of the pre-exilic Garden of Eden account found on the plates of brass. The received text of Genesis 4 lacks a narrative of Adam and Eve overcoming the effects of their transgression in the garden. Although this becomes a prominent theme in Jewish Midrash, Christian apocryphal literature, and Islamic stories of the prophets, three passages in Restoration Scripture contain narratives of the redemption of Adam, Eve, and their posterity. The narrative corresponding to Genesis 4 and Moses 5, 1 through 6, 7, Enoch's account of Adam's baptism in Moses 6, verses 48 through 68, and Alma's speech to the people of Ammonihah in Alma 12, 22 through 37. These narratives contain some elements that fit especially well in a pre-exilic Israelite context and that may once have been part of Genesis.
The narrative in Moses 5 through 6 mentions three animal sacrifices, two of which are not found in the biblical text. First, Adam and Eve are commanded to offer a sacrifice to the firstlings of their flocks, which Adam does, after which an angel appears and explains that this sacrifice is a similitude of the future sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father. That's in Moses 5. Similarly, rabbinic tradition mentions Adam sacrificing a bullock soon after his expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Next, Abel offers a sacrifice of sheep in Moses 5, and this corresponds to Genesis 4. Finally, Seth offers sacrifice, which is said to be like unto his brother Abel. And that's in Moses 6. The prominence of animal sacrifice in the narrative would be at home in an ancient Israelite context and may well be a survival from a pre-exilic form of the Genesis text. In his preaching to the people of Ammonihah in Alma 12, Alma recounts events after the expulsion from the garden. He goes on in chapter 13 to describe the ordination of priests. Alma's review of events overlaps with Moses 5 through 6. However, the order of events and many of the details are different. While the account in the, Moses, in the book of Moses frequently uses New Testament language, the language of Alma's account is more like the Old Testament suggesting that his account derives from a pre-exilic version of Genesis found on the plates of brass. Alma's account divides into two stages, Alma, uh, both in Alma 12, first verses 27 through 32, and then verses 33 through 35. In the first stage, it is appointed unto men that they must die and come to judgment. God initiates the process of redemption by sending angels to converse with men and to cause them to behold of his glory. Men is the term used here uh, in Alma's account. Men begin from that time forth to call on his name. In response, God converses with men and makes known to them the plan of redemption, and he gives them commandments to not do evil. Three aspects of this text help to situate it in a specific part of Genesis 4. The generic reference to men consistently used after our first parents are cut off from the tree of life in verse 26. The repeated use of the word appointed in three instances here, and the phrase began to call on his name. All of these aspects fit with Genesis 4, 25 through 26. Eve declares that Seth, from the root sheet, appoint, is thus named for, is thus named, for God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. And after Seth has a son named Enos, a name meaning man, the text states, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Thus, the text encourages us to believe that Alma 12, 27 through 32 is derived from a text that originally existed at the end of Genesis 4. In the second stage of Alma's account, God calls on men in the name of his son, promising that those who repent and harden not their hearts will receive mercy through his only begotten son, and will enter into God's rest. God also swears in his wrath that those who harden their hearts and do iniquity will not enter into his rest. It's possible that this text belongs at the beginning of Genesis, eight, uh, of Genesis 6, or somewhere near there, in the narrative of the flood uh, uh, and of Noah, whose name means rest. For Alma, the primordial history included an ordination of priests, something that is absent from both the received text of Genesis and the book of Moses. Immediately after his review of events following the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden, Alma says the following, and again, my brethren, I would cite your minds forward to the time when the Lord God gave these commandments unto his children. And I would that ye should remember that the Lord God ordained priests after his holy order which was after the order of his son, to teach these things unto the people. And those priests were ordained after the order of his son in a manner that thereby the people might know in what manner to look forward uh, to his son for redemption. Alma here appears to be quoting or paraphrasing a pre-existing text since he urges his audience to remember these events, implying that they have already learned them. Further, he twice uses the divine name, the Lord God, much like the account in Genesis 2 through 3, in contrast to his usual separate use of the names God and Lord. His uncharacteristic usage in this verse may suggest that he is quoting an ancient version 
of the biblical record found on the plates of brass. The archaic text of Genesis, as envisioned through Latter-day Saint Revelation, through Latter-day Revelation, lends itself well to a performative context. Based on Alma 13, it seems likely that this performative context was the installation of priests, which was performed at the temple in ancient Israel. Joseph Smith's interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis sets up a situation of dialogue that could easily be performed. The clothing of Adam and Eve in the narrative matches the clothing of the priests in the ritual. After this, as Adam and Eve are expelled, the focus of the liturgy would shift from the temple interior, representing the garden, to the court just below the porch where the altar of sacrifice is located. The consecration rite for priests involved uh, three animal sacrifices, which took place after the clothing in the priestly garments. First, a bullock would be slain. Next, a ram, and finally another ram. The account of the three animal sacrifices in Moses 5 through 6 could have functioned as a mythological precedent for the sacrifices to be offered in the consecration of priests. The first, the only one qualified as a sin offering, would recall the sacrifice of Adam soon after his transgression and expulsion from the garden. The latter two, both being sacrifices of rams offered to the Lord for a sweet savor, would recall the caprid sacrifices of, a of Abel and Seth which were explicitly similar to one another. If Alma 12, 33 through 35 was derived from the original Genesis account, this passage, passage's strong intertextual rela uh, connections with Psalm 95, 7 through 11 may help to support the passage's relationship to a liturgical context. The Psalm reads, today if you will hear his voice, Harden not your heart, as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. This strong similarity of language might suggest that Psalm 95 was chanted as part of the priestly installation liturgy. According to Davies, Psalm 95 is pre-exilic and had a liturgical function. In conclusion, I have argued that Restoration Scripture gives indications of a pre-exilic version of the first six chapters of Genesis, a version that differs significantly from the received text of Genesis in some passages. This table shows the differences I have discussed, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this in detail. It basically restates uh, what, I've, what I've gone through in this paper, uh, suggesting emendations to the original text of Genesis. In broad terms, this reconstructed text aligns with various actions of the priestly installation ritual as described in the Pentateuch, washing, clothing, anointing, animal sacrifices, ordination, and the facilitation of ritual approach by the people. The following reconstruction shows a possible way in which the liturgy of priestly installation may have unfolded. In order to summarize the points made above, and to demonstrate that the uh, scattered indications found in Restoration Scripture yield a coherent picture when put together with the biblical evidence. This should not be interpreted as a definite position on the ritual sequence. I'm not saying that all these details are, are fully accurate necessarily. Um, so this shouldn't be interpreted as a definite position on that since many aspects remain speculative. So first, the... Uh, oh, First, the, uh, the officiator would prepare for the ritual, and then uh, those who are to be installed as priests are brought to the temple porch and washed with water. This is referencing Exodus 29, verse 4. The officiator reads the creation narrative from Genesis 1, 1, 1 through 2, 7. At the point when God brings the man into the garden in Genesis 2, verse 8, the candidates are brought inside the temple doors. The officiator reads the garden narrative from Genesis 2, 8 through 3, 21, while parts are acted out by priests and or candidates. At the point in the narrative when God clothes Adam and Eve in coats of skins, the candidates are clothed in the priestly coats. The officiator reads of Adam and Eve being expelled. The candidates are ushered out to the temple court and the doors decorated with cherubim are shut. The officiator and candidates move to the altar of sacrifice in the temple court. 
The officiator reads of Adam's sacrifice, Abel's sacrifice, the murder of Abel, the birth of Seth, Seth's sacrifice, angels visiting men, men receiving commandments, and priests being ordained to teach the commandments. The officiator implicitly acts the role of the angels as he reads the commandments to the candidates. The officiator anoints the candidates, ordains them by the laying on of hands, and clothes them with the girdles and bonnets. The bullock and two rams are sacrificed on the altar, and the priests partake of a sacred meal on the temple porch, where they remain for, se for seven days. At the end of the seven days, the officiator reads of God's exhortation to repent and enter into, the, into his rest through his son. Participants chant Psalm 95, and the priests assist the people in offering sacrifices and approaching the temple. The arguments offered here encourage a particular approach to the ancient scriptures revealed through Joseph Smith. This approach treats these texts as authentic ancient records with complex textual histories much like the Bible itself. Some of these texts, including the Book of Moses, are ancient revelations that perform their own textual histories, telescoping backwards in time. In all cases, despite the tentative nature of any such endeavor, one should seek to place the text in an appropriate historical context based on stylistic and cultural features. Only then does the text manifest its power as a witness of God's work down through the ages. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, David. Um, we've got far more questions than we have time, so I'm going to be selective in these. Uh, first off, I want to understand if I understood what you said correctly. So you started off talking about how you'd place the Book of Moses as fitting more carefully with or closely with early Christian material. And here you were arguing that it was uh, fits in with pre-exilic material or along with the rest of the material. Um, that's a, a jump in time. Would you care to explain a little bit more how that works? Sure. So I think the way I think of the Book of Moses, it's essentially an early Christian text, but it includes parts or fragments, uh, if you will, uh, derived from some earlier text or texts. Okay. Um, people have noted several, I mean, this, uh, this is very common in the literature because the Book of Moses has usually been understood as a pre-exilic text. And so there, there have been a lot of studies that have noted connections with, uh, with ancient Israelite um, practice and literature uh, and Near Eastern literature um, even apocryphal literature ranging, uh, ranging widely. So, uh, so yeah, it's essentially a pre-exilic text incorporating some earlier texts. Okay. Um, we have a very short time, so a quick answer. Is there any evidence that an archaic version of the early chapters of Genesis may have circulated independently from the rest of the Genesis or the rest of the Pentateuch? That's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of any, of any evidence right off, off the top of my mind. Um, it would be useful to look uh, through the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are um, some scrolls that, uh, that include uh, Genesis or parts of Genesis. It would be interesting to look and see if any of those could be shorter texts originally, um, but, but I'm not sure. I think it's a really intriguing suggestion. <laughs> 